Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to this press conference from the 48th annual meeting here in Davos. It's the evening of the second day uh, of the annual meeting. Welcome to all of you here in the room. Welcome to those of you watching uh, on the live stream, whether on our website, Facebook or Periscope. And of course, a special welcome to our wonderful panel here this evening. Um, we're starting late, uh, but we're not starting too late to rethink the modern consumption economy, which is the title of this press conference. Um, but without further ado, um, let me introduce uh, the, the panel to you. Uh, to my immediate left, we're joined by Franz van Houten, the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Royal Philips, uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, he's also a member of the International Business Council of the World Economic Forum. To his left, we're joined by Alan MacArthur, the founder of the Alan MacArthur Foundation. Um, and right at the heart and center of our panel, we are joined by Eric Solheim, the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP, as you might know it. Um, Next to him, we're joined by Isabel Fernandez. She is a member of the managing board and global head of wholesale banking of the ING Group, or ING, I think, as you say in, in the Netherlands. And last but definitely not least, this wonderful panel is completed by uh, no one else than Peter Lacey, the global managing director for growth, strategy, and sustainability at Accenture. Uh, again, welcome. Um, let's start in the seating order, um, Franz. Uh, let's hear from you. Um, we had quite some discussion about the title of this press conference, Rethinking the Modern Consumption uh, Economy, because you were quite um, uh, um, forcefully arguing, you say, this has to go beyond our traditional understanding of consumption. So I'd like to invite you to tell us uh, about your thinking. Yeah, what, um, so thank you for that. Um, the word consumption we need to associate with the use of the earth's natural resources. And whereas you could say you use them in a linear model, you could reuse them, but mostly they end up on landfills. And, and then they are finite. Then there's not enough rare earth and other materials to continue uh, to live our lives. Um, so we need to do something about it. And uh, at the current rate of resource use, um, United Nations estimates that we'll need to mine 180 billion tons of material every year by 2050, double the amount that we use today. It's just not a sustainable model. Besides that, we are all worried very much about the effect on the environment uh, and what that will do to, to new generations. So I think everybody agrees with that. And the positive thing is, is that we are seeing a huge interest in the economic transformation from a linear economy to a circular economy. Right? But then people look lazily and say, how do you do that? You know, how do you go about it? How do you get on the bandwagon? Uh, and then there is a lot of talk, but no action. Now, that's not what we like. And last year um, uh, at the World Economic Forum, we could finally see progress on plastics. And you will hear about that. But we said plastics is one huge part of the problem, but we have to do much more. So we created together with many people the platform to accelerate the circular economy. Um, it's a platform for leadership. It's a platform for sharing best practice to scale action. Uh, and we have defined over the last 12 months a whole slate of projects, um, um, both uh, topical as well as geographical. Uh, and we have seen a lot of people step up to the plate and say, I'm going to be part of it. And that is what we reviewed today, and we saw tremendous progress. Um, and uh, we want to share some of those successes with you today. Now, for practicality, I will report out on the project that I lead. Um, uh, we would like, in the, in, the, in the project that I lead, we would like to close the loop on capital equipment. Right? So that is the, the bigger machines, photocopiers, medical equipment, um, machines that uh, typically go to B2B customers. Um, actually, we often know where that goes. I know where all the medical equipment is going, and therefore it is obligation to take it back and to recuperate the value from it. Um, and so Philips has pledged to do that. Um, and then we said, well, but that's not enough. Who else will join? that initiative. So we uh, sent out letters, we contacted many CEOs of other B2B companies, 
and within weeks we had commitments from companies like HP, Cisco, Dell, Mitsubishi, uh, Van der Lande, KPN, uh, ASML, uh, and I can go on, right? So it is a matter of calling people out on their accountability and say, what are you going to do? And then, of course, sharing the best practice. So you can learn from each other. Uh, you, how do you design for, for reuse? How do you actually uh, transform business models where maybe the ownership doesn't transfer to the user, but only the benefit is being sold? Uh, and so I think together we are creating momentum in the capital equipment manufacturers. Um, and um, yeah, that's what we are now going to move forward. And of course, we also we will regularly report out where we are. So that was one initiative that we reviewed as part of the platform. And so let's hear about another one. Yeah, let's hear about another. Thank you, Franz. And uh, all in all, you mentioned some. All in all, it was um, uh, 40 leaders who, who signed on to the platform, which is a great success. Eric, let me actually uh, jump to you. I know you feel strongly about the, the topic of plastics, uh, and I understand that is... Uh, uh, I hope it's not keeping you up at night, but it's something you feel strongly about. Sh share with us what, uh, uh, what, what you're working on. I sleep very well at night, and <laughs> it comes from the fact that contrary to the media message we nearly all believe in, the world is moving very fast and mainly in a positive direction. And the problems we're here to resolve come from the enormous success of humanity. As long as everyone was dirt poor, uh, everyone was in a uh, uh, recycling uh, uh, or, or, or a circular economy. My grandparents threw away nothing because they used everything in their life. And the same is this st still the case with the poorest people on the planet in India or, 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 or Africa. But fortunately, we are bringing 150,000 people out of extreme poverty every day. It's not covered anywhere. So that was on the front page of the New York Times or the Fox News or, or wherever. It will completely change our uh, perspective on the world. We are hugely successful. We are much, much fewer, uh, fewer uh, poor people. Nearly all will in the next decades be part of the global middle class. Our aim is that every single citizen on the planet should be uh, uh, part of the middle class by 2030. But then, of course, comes the problem. A global population of 10 billion people all of them wanting, and most of them already having uh, mobile phones, and the vast majority of humans already have. We cannot continue to buy a new uh, phone every year, just throw it away, uh, and not recycling the component. There are simply not enough uh, minerals for that to happen. But it comes from the success. And the plastic problem also comes from the success, for plastic is an enormously useful material, but when 10 million people are using it and just we throwing it away like that, it cannot continue. Uh, and then we need to start acting, and that's, the, of course, the purpose of this, to bring together citizens, business, and government into what is smart, concerted action uh, to curb the problems. And take plastics as an example. We need three ways of action. We need citizens' actions. Uh, in India, a young lawyer called Afro Shah started the greatest beach cleanup in human history. It's, that's now continued for 110 consecutive weeks at the beaches of Mumbai, bringing in any amount of plastic. And by that, by doing that, also making the politicians and business enthusiastic. Prime Minister Modi has spoken at length to the Indian people about this hero of India, after Shah, who just started bringing plastic with his own, uh, own hands. That's citizens' part. Then governments need to act. Many governments are now acting, and just last week I was in the Pacific, Marshall Islands, Vanuatu, small uh, Pacific Islands, have prohibited plastics. In Africa, Rwanda, Kenya, Eritrea, bigger nations have prohibited the one-use plastic. Uh, the Kenyan government was very uncertain. Can we do this? Will there be a pushback? Then they prohibited it. If you come to the Nairobi airport now, the first you will see is a huge bin where you are supposed to put the plastic bag. Because you take it into Nairobi, you can be in prison for half a year. Uh, they will maybe not be that harsh to France or me or, or Ellen if we were to break it. Uh, but that's, that shows the determination. And interesting enough, the people li line up. They support it because they see the immediate benefit of less plastic bags in the streets or in the national parks or at the beautiful beaches of Kenya. So that's the government part. And then, of course, the business part. How do we make much better plastic products? 
how can business reduce plastic in the value chain? We just today uh, listened to Coca-Cola, uh, who, uh, who will now promise to recover as many plastic bottles as they produce. Uh, enormously positive uh, commitment, and of course, it will also spread to other companies. Nestle and Danone announced that by 2020, all their bottles will be degradable in nature, and they will make the technology available for everyone. So a lot is happening. This is coming from our great success as humans in making this broad, fan fantastic global middle class, but then we need to be much, much smarter in the way we consume. And that's what this platform is all about. Thank you, Eric. Alan, um, Eric mentioned his grandparents. The partnership between the World Economic Forum and the Alan MacArthur Foundation doesn't go quite back that far. <laughs> um, <laughs> however, um, uh, we have been uh, partnering and working together for, for four years, quite mm -hmm. successful years, especially also on the, on the area of plastics. And uh, most of you here in the room and those of you following these, uh, these topics, you will remember that that report uh, that had the headline, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2020. 50. It was 2050, sorry. Um, it, it, takes, uh, it takes a little bit more time, thankfully. But still, um, there is an interest in that topic, and you've been working very intensely mm -hmm. on that. Where do we stand? What's the latest uh, that you can talk about of your work there? I think the first thing to say is there's phenomenal momentum that we've seen through the dialogue at the World Economic Forum around circular economy and, and indeed further afield. Um, I think it's important to, to start at the beginning as to where this all came from, particularly as we're here at the WEF, because you know, the circular economy is an idea which is gaining momentum. More and more people are beginning to understand it. There's a lot of economic rationale to do it. But what we did in conjunction with WEF and McKinsey at the outset of creating Project Mainstream, which we were very lucky to have friends chairing, was to say, if we really want to build circular change, if we really want to make this happen, then we actually need to take a material stream and try and change that. And that's exactly what we did with the mainstream board. We looked at many material streams. We picked one which was plastic, to Eric's point. It's incredibly high volume, very low value, incredibly useful, and goes all over the world. Um, and actually, the biggest company, you know, Coke or Pepsi or Unilever, these guys cannot solve it on their own. Even the sector, in many ways, can't solve it on their own because you need the cities, the regions, the chemical companies, the waste reprocessors. You need everybody to work together to try to fix the plastics problem. And that can only be done, A, with that dialogue, B, with then a general understanding as to where we go. And I think that's been vital in the new plastics economy work because we've seen not only you know, 40 companies signing up last year, we now have 11 companies saying we absolutely, as Fran said, we, we absolutely say we will change the way that we do things. We are going to aim to have plastic which is 100% recyclable or even 100% recycled or we'll look for different, op uh, different materials. So we're seeing this change and I think what's come out of the new plastics economy is this, this kind of feeling that if we have a framework to innovate underneath, towards, then we can all be on the same path. And with the last report here at WEF on new plastics economy, we had the 50-20-30 split. 50% 50 of plastic should be designable, to Coke's point, so it can be absolutely recoverable and have value. So that's every single piece of plastic that's produced in the future has a value because it's designed to have a value because it's designed to be recycled. 20% can be reused and there are many different reuse models and we should move towards more of those because they, they obviously s they slow down the flow of plastic. But there's also the 30% of the very small format sachets which really won't be economically recoverable. They're not because they're multi-film, they're complex, they're just not recycled and that's one of the problems. We have so much plastic in the world, 78 million tons of packaging alone, and yet most of it's not designed to ever have value once it's been used. And so that's where the innovation space lies. That's where the new bottles that biodegrade and and actually add to nature because they're a resource. Or actually yesterday evening here at the WEF, we launched the, or we released the winners of a $2 million innovation prize around the new plastics economy to look at two halves. One is the design of plastic packaging so it can be recycled and does have value, which is not currently always the case as, I, as I've pointed out. And the second is to look at those different materials to look at that 30% that needs to be redesigned. And we've had hundreds of applicants from all over the world and it really was very exciting to be there because it's about the opportunity to build a new plastics economy that really can work. And the new plastics economy has led to other systemic initiatives, uh, one on fibers that we're working on. There's another we launched here at the WEF uh, earlier today, which is looking at cities and the circular economy for food, real systemic changes that need everybody around the table to make them happen, which are complex. But once we have that dialogue around the table, we really can make a difference. And we can start to shift from linear, as Franz said, to circular. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. 
Um, Isabel, I wish you were here to say you found a way how we can spend money and then reuse it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, that is not, however, what you're here to announce. Um, what is it you want to talk about, please? All right. Well, um, I think that's a great challenge, so maybe for next year. But <laughs> it, it, I share a lot of the optimism of this, pla uh, this, this panel here. A lot is happening. But I also recognize that many of us are multinational companies who have resources and who are expected, rightly so, to take the lead. But we're not the only uh, people out there um, polluting the earth, if you will. Um, there are many mid-sized companies who uh, have opportunities but also have challenges. If you just look at uh, Europe, for instance, the small and medium enterprises make up 99% of uh, the companies. They make up uh, two-thirds of se private sector employment, and they make up 64% of industrial pollution. We need to get them on board. And so what have we uh, we've done? We've created an opportunity for particularly medium-sized companies because they have often a knowledge gap, a technology gap, a financing gap, and lack sometimes the buy-in from their clients or suppliers. So how do we help them? We help them with something called the Circular Supply Chain Accelerator. I think we need a new name, but you get the drift. Uh, it's an accelerator to try to help them because these mid-sized companies form part of a big value chain. And if we can help them in their supply chain to understand how they design the business models, get the buy-in from the large companies that operate there uh, and their clients, we probably can come up with much better solutions. So this accelerator will help. Um, it starts uh, it, by industry. We've picked an industry uh, with uh, building and construction. We started this initiative last year, but realized financing is just one piece of it. So we uh, uh, worked with our friends at Accenture Strategy. I'm sure Peter will talk more about it. And Circular Economy. Uh, Circular Economy. We've also um, now teamed up with uh, Royal BAM and Arup to see if we can support this. And how does this work in practice? Very simple. Um, we identify a problem, say, in the building and construction industry, uh, a block of houses or an office building, and invite suppliers to come up with solutions. Then we help them to see if we, in our accelerator, can see if we can take all the pieces of that solution and develop that into a circular model, uh, and then find this, the financing uh, and offer that financing opportunity to multiple, to a panel of financiers, so it's not just about us, uh, and just to see if we can make these work. And then we go from one sector to the next and to the next and the next. So I really hope I'll be sitting here next, uh, next year with, uh, with a lot of new business models that we've actually put into action. Thank you, Isabel. Peter, none of the especially business leaders who joined the, uh, the platform for accelerating the circular economy would be able to do this if there, there wasn't a business case behind it. Uh, it has to, it's still, it's still a company, uh, right? So from your uh, uh, perspective at Accenture Strategy, um, can you give us some examples of how this works? Well, the first thing I think to say is, wow, isn't the circular economy on the move from capital equipment to plastics to fibers to finance. If you think about where we were just a few years ago, the pace uh, to pick up on the, the platform for accelerating the uh, circular economy, um, good circular economy puns, you know, always, uh, always useful you did there, for you. Yes, see what yes, I did. Yes, yes. But the pace really is picking up and so is the scale. Um, three points. The first is that to your point about the business case, what we're seeing is a real uptick in high quality innovation, innovation in business models, innovation in applying the next generation of fourth industrial revolution technologies to both create impact in the circular economy, but also to create very competitive, very viable business models. Right. And that's when I think we will know that circular economy has come of age, is when actually it just becomes the way in which markets function and the way in which businesses think about strategy. And we're probably only at the foothills, but we are now climbing the mountain, I think, in terms of that level of innovation. So innovation. The second point would be momentum. Ellen mentioned that as well. As a proxy for that, the World Economic Forum in conjunction with a number of other companies and with Accenture Strategy have for the last four years run the circulars. If you like our answer to the Oscars for circular economy uh, innovation in government, in business, in large companies, exactly to the point Isabel made, in small companies and medium-sized companies. And 
oh my goodness, what an extraordinary shift over that four years in terms of the quality and quantity. We had the prize on Monday night, entries up another 50%, 300 organizations from around the world. And what is staggering for me is just how impressive some of those companies are. Not just the large multinationals like the Ikeas and the Philips and, and ING's and all the folks who are sat here, but also phenomenal businesses like AMP Robotics, looking at deploying artificial intelligence, for example, radically rethinking the way in which we manage waste in different municipalities around the world. And my final point would be scale. Because what we also saw in those awards was that there is a global diffusion taking place on circular economy. So this isn't the preserve of Northwestern Europe or the US. What we saw with this year's circulars is that we saw 45 countries, entries from 45 countries on the table in six continents. And what I think we're excited about, what WEF is excited about, is that this is now becoming very much a developing economy issue as well. We've all just come from a session where we saw innovation from Indonesia, from Rwanda, from all over the world. So that final point that this is becoming a real global phenomenon. And so I would just say more pace, more effort in 2018. We need to take this to scale at speed as the circular economy becomes more and more something of age. Thank you, Peter. Franz, let me come back to you. Um, we said 40 leaders have signed. Uh, almost 3,000 are in Davos. So there's, there's room for more on that platform. What's your message to your peers here in Davos? Yeah, I think a lot more people need to step up and commit, right? And uh, that, that is clearly a call to action. Um, now, I was very pleased today because um, we had many government representatives participating. We got a letter from the China Council for International Cooperation on Environment pledging that they will uh, put this all in their five-year plan. And when China decides something, it gets done. Right? We had uh, the government of Slovenia, Indonesia, Peru, Rwanda, Nigeria um, here, among others. And they, they are all mobilizing their, uh, in the local communities, uh, companies um, and NGOs to get this done. So I, I'm positive. Uh, if you look at companies, you know, we had uh, Cisco, HP, IKEA, Coca-Cola uh, and many others. If we just get impact with these people, mm. uh, it's going to set the tone and the pace and the example in the world. So um, I'm more uh, interested in people who join, who really do something, than trying to measure by the sheer numbers. Right? Uh, to have 3,000 signatories that do, do nothing is not valuable. Mm. So uh, I feel that with the, 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 the people in the room, everybody is, is doing real action. Also next week when we are back home, Right. Just to, to explain and to be transparent about it, we have had a review call every month you know, uh, for the last year, just to make sure that things progress. Um, and uh, we are now heading in the, in the second quarter to the meetings of the uh, uh, GEF and, and, and UN, where I think there's going to be real momentum on setting free resources to push this. So the platform is gaining momentum, and we are clearly not there yet. But you know, it's going it's, in the right direction. It's picking up pace yeah. to to learn from Peter here. Um, thank you very much, Franz. Um, let's see, we're out of time, but let's see if we have uh, uh, one or two questions from the audience. Uh, maybe we allow us to be a little bit unswiss with the timing here. Um, can I see a show of hands if there's any questions? No. So that's. Uh, that is, after all, a Swiss, a Swiss organization. Okay, thank you for respecting that. Uh, it's good for you to know that there is also a press release with a little bit more information uh, on PACE uh, going out as we speak. You'll find it uh, on the forum's website. And uh, if you're a member of the media here in Davos, you'll definitely have it in your inbox as well. Um, follow this space for the interesting developments. Uh, thank you very much uh, to my panelists today. And thank you very much all for being here and for watching. Thank you. <laughs>